I've come up from Portishead Marina, <laughs> um, up the hill, and it's nice to be here. Thanks for the invite, nice to be back again. It's a bit like a longevity contest today, isn't it? How many years you've been in ministry yeah. and things. Uh, I've almost done 50, 50 years in full-time ministry, uh, 25 years as pastoring in different parts of the country, and the last 25 years as one of the national leaders of Elim, the New Pentecostal Church and travel the country regularly and overseas as well. I'm now retired, which means I've laid down all my authority positions, national positions, international positions, and anything else that I had. So I have no authority whatsoever, but uh, mainly through relationship now. I'm preaching most weekends and uh, a fair bit of stuff still in Western Europe. It's interesting to hear about Eastern Europe. That's had an edge of... Uh, very high blessing for a number of years. Uh, it's come into freshness and newness. Uh, it hasn't touched Western Europe as yet. And they still struggle. There's different pockets of blessing and different areas where things are beginning to be new and fresh and, and different. But Western Europe is very secular. It's very materialistic. And uh, I work quite a bit in France and Spain and Italy, um, mainly with the leaders. And what I do like this is mainly with leaders, and I find that one of the most refreshing and exciting periods of ministry, where you're speaking to leaders and trying just to encourage and bless and inspire and bring just a word at seasons where maybe they're going through trials and tribulations, which we all go through, mm. and just to come alongside in different ways. I'm off to Italy again in a couple of weeks, and we bring all our leaders together in Sicily, and Reggio Calabria, right at the toe of Italy. And some of them really struggle in, in mafia areas and oppressive areas and poverty-stricken areas. And just to speak into the heart of that is uh, a great privilege and, and a great pleasure and uh, something I love doing. What I tend to do, because I do so much with leaders, um, trying to be fresh and new and different all the time, I scour the Old Testament for leadership lessons. This book is amazing because it has so many people that learn things at different styles, different ways, through trials, through tribulation. They learn things and out of their experience and character forming, very often you can find incredible lessons. Mm -hmm. And I stumbled on two things in the life of Jacob, which I hadn't really seen before. And you wouldn't hold up Jacob as a kind of great spiritual dynamic leader. Uh, he was a twist of cheek, he was a deceiver. You know the story, he stole his brother's birthright, there was a contract over his life, he ran, he spent time in a wilderness and encountered God in the dream, Jacob's ladder and the angels ascending and descending and all of that went on. And Out of that he did something which I stumbled on, I preached on Jacob for years, uh, read through Genesis many, many times and never quite saw what I saw that day. He, uh, in Genesis 28, if you want to just look it up with me for a moment, when he met God, encountered God, in verse 16 of Genesis 28, Jacob awoke from his sleep and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God and the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone that he had placed under his head and raised it up as a pillar. And here's the two things that he did. He poured oil on top of it and he called that place Bethel, although the city used to be called Luz. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd never seen that before. I'd read it many, many times, preached on Jacob, preached on Genesis, gone through the whole scenario of what Jacob did but missed completely the fact that when he woke, having encountered God, he poured oil onto the rock on which he was sleeping. He poured oil in his hard place. And then he made a declaration. He called the name of that place Bethel, rather than calling it Luz. Luz means wilderness. Bethel means house of bread or house of God. And he did two things that changed the whole nature of his experience with God and the life of Israel. He was on the run as Jacob, which means twist to cheat. 
He came home years later as Israel, which is Prince with God, and it all seems to focus on the point where he encountered God and changed something. He did something different and new. So I want to examine those two things and maybe just share a couple of thoughts with you that just might inspire and encourage. Jacob poured oil on his hard place. Jacob was not a travelling evangelist with a bottle of oil <laughs> looking for people he could anoint and pray. He wasn't an elder, James 5, anointing the sick and the Lord will raise them up. He wasn't anything like that. He was a liar, twister, cheat. He had oil in the saddlebags of his camel or his horse, purely for medicinal purposes or for purification or even for cooking. There was nothing spiritual about it. There was no incentive for vision to go and pray, anoint somebody, not even in his thinking. He's a liar, twister, cheat. And yet when he encounters God, he does something totally out of his normal boundary, totally out of any previous experience that he may have had, and he pours the oil onto his hard place. Now you've got to ask a lot of questions. Did he see that done in years gone by, maybe with his father or his grandfather Abraham? Did he have a flashback of memory where maybe Abraham at the altar brought his family together and all the people that he had gathered, which were hundreds, Lot's family as well? Did he at some time see Abraham use oil when he lit the altar and roasted animals and prayed and made covenants and met God himself? Was there oil involved in that or was it just something that came supernaturally into the heart and mind of Jacob? I got the feeling, can't prove it by scripture in any way at all, but I think the revelationary encounter that Jacob had quickened something in his spirit and brought out of him something that he'd never seen, never done, never experienced, a revelation of oil. Now you and I know, we've been around long enough to know that oil is the symbol of the Holy Spirit. Oil is the softening and the moulding of character. Oil is the thing that blesses, the oil of gladness. All of that kind of spiritual stuff is contained in oil. And I just wonder sometimes, out of the uniqueness of Jacob's journey, out of his desperate flight from a contract where his brother said, I'll take his life, out in the desert, on his own, trying to sleep, encounters God, sees the angels, has that moment of incredible encounter with God, out of it comes a revelationary moment that oil made the difference. So he gets up, goes to the camel bag, the saddle bags of his camel, brings out the oil, pours it on the rock, and anoints his hard place. And you and I need to learn over and over again, because we're so slow at doing this, we... We learn it and then it goes on the back burner. We learn it and then we forget it and it passes away. And We try all kinds of experiments to grow churches, encourage churches, repurpose churches, re-energize churches. We go through the whole gamut of trying to do things that make a difference. And when it all boils down, it's the oil. It's not how clever your constitutions are. It's not how good your gimmicks are, how many flashing lights you might have how many introductions of, of uh, soft church, welcoming church, um, all kinds of seeker-friendly churches. All those things are good and proper, but they're secondary. That's right. They're not the priority. They're not the focal point of what we do. We need to remember over and over and over again, it's only the oil that can soften our hard place. We talked about Turkey, talked about Romania, talked about Biddeford, talked about different parts of Devon. All of these places need the oil. Mm -hmm. Not clever churches, not great entrepreneurial productions, not gimmicks that maybe attract a few people, but it's the oil that makes the difference. And we need to learn over and over again in our leadership roles, in our dealing with people, talking to people over and over again, it's the oil. Yeah. I learned an amazing lesson on one occasion. I was preaching in a small church in Sweden. A friend of mine had gone to a very difficult situation, a little town called Okliuna, north of Malmo. And he inherited a small group of elderly people who didn't want to do very much, didn't want to go anywhere, nice comfortable church. They all sat in the same seat for the last 50 years and they knew their club and they knew their, their position and everything was fine. 
and he inherited this very closed unit of people. And he came with vision and spark, and he tried to introduce new things, and there was a bit of a fight and a bit of a battle that you've had, you've seen in the past and I've seen in the past, and all the kind of things that go on, we don't like it this way, we don't want it that way, we're comfortable here. And he went through all of that, and he decided to pray, Lord, show me what to do. How can I change this group of people? How can I bring them through their trials and their, their disappointments? Everyone carries baggage. They were happy where they were, didn't want anything new. And he began to pray, Lord, show me what to do to make the difference. He's driving through the town. And the Lord said to him as he stopped at a red traffic light in the junction of the main square of the town, look around and see what's missing. So he looked around at the red traffic light and he thought, I have no idea what's missing and what the message was. And the Lord said again very strongly, what is missing in this town? So he began to think about what he could bring into the town that was missing. And he worked out that there was, firstly, there was no hairdresser in Orkaluna. Everyone had to go 22 miles into Malmo to get their hair done. So he thought, when I build a church and get my own building, I will have a hairdresser in the church where people can come and have their hair done. He will allocate the room. And then he got you very excited because he looked with different eyes and he realized that there was, there was no hotel, no bed and breakfast in the whole town of Okuluna. So he decided that he would allocate in this new building, which wasn't there, it was a figment of his imagination, but when I get a building, I will have rooms for bed and breakfast where people can come and stay and enjoy a bit of a motel kind of thing. And then he got really excited because he discovered there was no dentist in Auckland, you know. <laughs> so he said, when I get a building, I will have a room for a dentist. And I will make sure people can come to my building to get their hair done, to have their teeth done, and they could stay. If they like it that much, they could stay. And the years went by, and he kept this in his heart. He brooded over all of this in his spirit. And one day he was walking past a big building. It was a... Um, a, a furniture shop, several floors, and he saw a notice saying redundancy. So he went to inquire, and over a number of months, a long period of time, he inherited this building, miraculously. M amazing story. And so he moved his people into the building, and he inspired them by saying, we're going to help our community, we're going to change the nature of our town. So on a Sunday morning, you have your worship time, Ladies can come and get their hair done. People can come and get their teeth done. And you can stay a while upstairs in three different rooms for bed and breakfast. And he asked me if I would come and open this building. Cut the ribbon, walk in and do all the kind of opening weekend ceremony. So we went over, Cara and I went over and we, we looked at the building. We were taken everywhere, done a superb job, allocated all the rooms for everything. And I'm preaching on the Sunday morning not knowing the full story at that particular point. And I'm preaching my way through, and halfway through the message, being interpreted into Swedish, God said to me, anoint this building. Now, I wish God wouldn't do that, <laughs> because when you're preaching, you're trying to keep going with the interpretation, and you're trying to keep the flow. And right into the middle of this, God says, anoint the building. I wish God would say that at the beginning so that you could plan it a little bit and work it through, but he doesn't do that, does he? He requires a level of faith and trust and obedience. So I kept preaching and I thought, okay, we'll, we'll do that at the end. And it came back stronger and stronger, anoint the building. So I stopped the message and I said to the pastor, do you have any oil? And he came up with this tiny little, tiny little bottle of oil, which wasn't even full. And I had in my mind, I was going to give everybody a little bit of oil and they could go and anoint the building. And it all planned in my mind what I would do. And he gave me this tiny little bottle of three quarter full oil. And the first person, I mean, that's what I was going to do. And the first person that came out had her hands like that. And stupidly, I, I poured some out into her hands. So the next person who comes along says, I'll have some oil, please. And I poured out. And I suddenly realized this is not going to go around all the people. Probably in that service, 40, maybe 50 people that have come for the opening. And I started to pour out this oil that wasn't enough. 
and everyone's excited because they've got him out of nighty doors and windows and rooms and beds and the dentist chair, all sorts of stuff are going around. And I'm pouring out this oil, which kept on pouring. And Carol's on the front row, and she's looking at me as if I've gone completely balmy, because I keep pouring out this oil that's not there. And I've emptied the bottle, and oil is still coming out of the bottle. And by the time we'd finished, every part of the building, three floors, upstairs, downstairs, outside, inside, every door, every window, every part of the building had been anointed. And when I gave him back the oil, there was still some oil left in the bottle. <laughs> now, I've never seen that before, never seen it since. I've never been bold enough to do it since. It's one of those moments when God says, okay, listen, you've got a building, and it's very unique, and you're going to bless the community, but it's not about that. It's more about the anointing of God that can come upon a community, upon a building, upon a people, that can shape the destiny for the future, change the town, change the atmosphere, bring it under an open heaven, and it's all about not the dentist or the hairdresser or the motel feel or even the people of the building. It's about the oil. Yeah. And I learned the lesson, and people obviously learned the lesson because the church has grown and developed over the years, and I saw a clip on YouTube recently where they had a gospel concert and the building is packed out to capacity. They changed the nature of their church. Not through vision of helping the community or the gimmicks or the plans or the dentist and all that. It's about the oil. And we need to discover it over and over and over again because we lose it and we forget it and we misappropriate it at various times. It's not about that. It's about the oil. And if only we could see that and keep the oil flowing and keep the current of God fresh and new spontaneous and effective that makes a difference so a, a leadership lesson from from jacob who's the twist of cheat who's unique in many many ways and not a classic kind of illustration of leadership he did something that made an incredible difference he softened his hard place and secondly he made a declaration and he said this place is awesome this is the gate of heaven and I no longer call it Luz, I call it Bethel. Mm -hmm. Luz is wilderness, mm -hmm. Bethel, house of bread, house of God. And he changed the location of where he was standing. Now you and I have the benefit of the Old Testament scriptures. We can go on generations. David, King David, came to Bethel. Samuel, the prophet, lived out of Bethel and prophesied out of Bethel. Bethel became a focal point in the whole nation's history almost as important as Jerusalem, not quite, but almost as fundamental to the worship and the culture of Israel and the fashioning of their understanding was Bethel and made an amazingly unique difference to the heart of the people. And here's Jacob standing there, changing the nature of his location. And I wonder how many times we have actually learned how to declare something in the heavenlies how to speak out of faith and make a declaration over our homes, over our families, over our future, over our finances, over our people. How many times have we declared the blessing of God? You can pick up the Old Testament. It happened over and over and over again. God yeah. said to Moses, tell Aaron to declare. Yeah. And in Exodus 6, he declares, the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious unto you. He declared something. When Jacob stole the birthright, he went to his father, deceived him by putting on different clothing and a different smell of his brother. And he said, bless me. And the old man blessed Jacob. He wasn't the inheritor. He wasn't the firstborn. He wasn't the one who should receive that. But he, uh, he, he stole the birthright. And when Esau heard of that, he came rushing in to say, bless me, Father. And, and the, the old man said, I've already done it. I can't do it again. I've made the declaration. And I wonder sometimes how many times have we preached? How many times have we counseled? How many times have we spent hours and hours with people? If only we had found the, the revelation of declaration, could it have made a difference? We went through a phase, I come from an Elim background, 
in their own for life. We went through a phase at one time where church leaders went to high places in their town. I remember going with our Huddersfield church to the highest point of Huddersfield and declaring over the town the blessing of God. And it was a kind of phase in different church life, maybe 15, 20, maybe 25 years ago, when that took place. And it was a kind of moment where the spiritual declaration over a town or a mm. church was felt, and I think a lot of cities and towns in Britain did that. And the years go by, and we neglect it, and we forget it, and it's past. And I wonder sometimes if we could only see the power of speaking faith over our people, Amen. over our churches, over our cities, over our locations, where it might just make a difference. Mm. On Sunday morning, I'm going up to uh, the Forest of Dean, one of our newer churches. Uh, it's got a rich background, but it came it came and joined Eden some back, some back again in Colford. And the church is being pastored by a guy who used to be a golf professional. And uh, he, he retired from that and pastoring the church. And he came from a background where, in a meeting, God said to him, go and speak faith over a community. It's a long story, but he, he ended up in the Forest of Dean where he prayed and preached and, and declared and the Forest of Dean a number of churches are beginning to grow in a way that they haven't done before mm. I think there's a, a CPI church not far away, Cinderford not far away mm. that is, is being affected by something new mm. and something fresh um, and it all became out of because of God said to this golf professional go and speak faith so here's Jacob standing in a wilderness. Mm. Luz. Nothing there. He's afraid. He slept badly. He encounters God. He's miles from anywhere. And he says, this place is going to be called Bethel. Mm. He couldn't see it, and it would be years before it would take place. Not instantaneous, but years of development where there would be roads and buildings and a city and a city wall and faith and King David, and the prophet Samuel. All of that would come in generation. But Jacob kicked it off by a measure of declaration. Yeah. So I wonder, oil and speaking faith, yeah. two leadership lessons. I stumbled on those some time back, out of a man's life who wasn't a natural-born Christian, godly leader. Uh, he's a liar, twister, cheat, and yet God can take anybody. He can take you, can take me can take the worst and the least and make them something. If only we could learn the, the, the concepts. It's oil that makes the difference and not the things that we do. And maybe speaking faith over our families, over our churches. It's not going to be instant, but you speak it into the heavenlies and it changes something. It does something that can make an amazing spiritual difference. So I just commend those two very simple little thoughts to you. And maybe can spark something in the church yeah. where you live, where you move, where you preach where you have your being mm. that just might make a difference mm. and I'd like to